All right. Okay, so we're going to be discussing Yom Kippur with Abba's Mo'edim. First place you go looking. I've already given you a clue. Leviticus what? 15. 15. Oh, 15. Before that. Leviticus 22. Okay. We're looking at the section of the 10th day of the 7th month. Before we unpack Leviticus 16, we're going to have to go through Leviticus 23. Okay. What does Leviticus 23 teach us about Yom Kippur? That one is the feast of the Day of Atonement. Coffee. Coffee and the land. Wash. We're going to get to this. Leviticus 16. Oh, is that Leviticus 16? When we get to Leviticus, someone read it. Leviticus 23. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Also, the tenth day of the seventh month shall be the day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you. You shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. And you shall do no work on that same day, for it is the day of atonement, to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For any person who does not afflict in soul on that same day shall be cut off from his people. And any person who does any work on that same day, that person I will destroy from among his people. You shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statue forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. It shall be to you a solemn Sabbath of rest. Sorry, I said that the wrong way. Sabbath of solemn rest. And you shall afflict your souls on the ninth day of the month at evening. From evening, well, month at evening. From evening to evening, you huh. shall celebrate your... So. Okay. so, let's break up this quickly. Yom means day. Kippur comes from the word kapera, which means to cover. It's the same word we used for atonement. Basically, that which covers my sin. Right? It atones for me. Okay? Now, according to Leviticus 23, just shorthand. It gives us a few instructions. First one, you will gather. Uh, uh, which one are you struggling to read there, but? Convocate. Convocate, gather, get together. Afflict your soul, offering, no work. It is forever and Sabbath. Okay. Convocate, just like all of them, they are holy convocations. That means the instruction means you have to get together. This is not one of those things where I'm going to sit at home and just be. It's like Shabbat, we're called to get together. Afflict your soul. Says more than once. What does it mean to afflict? Okay, some translations will say deny yourself mm -hmm. and yeah. traditionally what do we do on that day fast. fast okay but the word there isn't fast it's deny okay two different words so if it means to deny in a sense okay. some interpretations will say that okay. all right so this isn't a time of beating yourself up. Oh, it is a time where we kind of deny yourselves. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> this is a time where we kind of have to take stock. All right? Now, on Yom Kippur, we are going to go through the story of Jonah. And Jonah gives us a good indication of what it looks like when people make Teshuvah. They repent and they afflict their souls. When he went eventually, after some prodding to Nineveh, what did they do? <laughs> your, brain, your brain exploded there. <laughs> she had an equal moment. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, this is the 
Ja, ja. ja. Like what have you do now? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Stop, stop running. Okay. Yeah. So we get to the place of Nineveh. Who is Nineveh? It is the, the place. Of Nineveh. Yeah. Nineveh is a place, but who are they? Where are they? Where, 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 what is the story? Nineveh. 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 Yeah, John and the Nineveh. <laughs> Releasing a new hit single next week. <laughs> who are they? Who are they? They didn't have people. people. Yeah, but they... Yeah, well, that was obvious. They're Assyrians. Assyrians. <coughs> okay, what do we know about an Assyrian? <laughs> they they Assyrian. serve other gods. <laughs> <laughs> Number one, they were pagan. Okay. Number two, what made them so bad? Why did Jonah not want them to be saved? Maybe because he had... Because... I want, you to, I want you to think about it differently. We read the story of, story of Jonah as if Jonah was running from his instruction. Mm -hmm. He was not. He was running away so that they wouldn't be saved. Yes. He didn't want them to be saved. I can't remember why. They were already developing and building up as a country that had the most bloodthirsty mm -hmm. army known to man. They treated people like, like cattle. Yeah. <laughs> nope. No, they, they, would walk, they, would walk, they would walk into a place like this, size up whom they didn't kill, and see whom they could sell. Oh. Then they would take whatever they want to sell, and they would say, they we're going to march you back to Assyria. That's where the markets are going to happen. So what are we going to do? We're going to stick a nose ring in your ear, and we're going to put a hook, and we're going to attach it to our horse. And you're going to walk. What happens if you fall? <laughs> it was the second one. Detach. Don't worry, we'll reattach it. <laughs> if you died, you're stuck. We cut you loose. It's fine. Remember the Samaritans. Enough to keep you alive because yeah. how am I going to sell you if you're in bad shape? Yeah. The Samaritans were created by the Assyrians because some sections, if I came and I conquered the whole of Israel, I would take some people from Israel and put it here, but I conquered entire regions as well. So I would bring different men and women together. I would leave them together. They would make families. And then they don't have identity anymore, so they won't rebel. The Samaritans were some Israelites that were left mixed with a whole bunch of other nations. And they were left there to repopulate the area they just cleaned out. Jonah, go and pray for them. Tell them to repent or they're going to be destroyed. No. Just destroy them. Where was Jonah from? Oh, that was the place you went. Oh, it was the same place Jesus was from. Close. Yeah. Galilee. Yeah. He was one of the only prophets that we know of that actually came from the Galilee. Remember in the Gospels, you will hear someone say, Does any prophet come from Galilee? Yes, Jonah. And Jonah had a call to go talk to Gentiles. The salvation of Christ is it Jews only? No, because it parallels not only like David, but also like Jonah, which reached groups of people outside of the kingdom. All right? Mm -hmm. So Jonah gives us this picture of, they walk in eventually after some whale-eating negotiations. He gets over to the other side and he's repent, or your kingdom will be destroyed. And he's hoping they don't repent because he marches through three days, mm -hmm. and he goes and he sits and he waits for the destruction. And what do they do? They fast. They stop everything. Their animals get sackcloth. They sit in sackcloth and ashes. They stop eating or drinking. And they pray. A pagan nation. He did at the point of one prophet, which is really ironic. Because at the time of Jonah, there were prophets in Israel asking them to do the same thing. And they didn't repent. Jonah is a parallel to a contemporary of other prophets, and then the responses that they got were completely different. God was using that to highlight 
It's the stubbornness that was going on in Judah and Israel. Send a prophet, you don't listen. And here he goes out and they stop everything. No food, no water, nothing. Hopefully God will repent. Well, hopefully God will save us. Not repent, while we repent. And yeah, when they denied themselves, it pointed to a full fast, a dry fast is what they call it. That's one aspect. If you hear, or you are really torn up inside, or you are really concerned about something, are you really focusing on what you're going to eat? No. No. So if God says to you, you and me, we're going to deal with your sin. Oh, and by the way, if you do any other work on that day, you're out. He didn't say that once, did he? He says, you and me, you pitch up. I'll get to why in a bit. Leviticus 16 gives us the heart of God. But he gives us a warning in the midst of it. And he says, listen, I need you here. I want you here. If you choose not to be, what are you telling me? We'll get into that. If I am so busy being about my day, your day is normally planned around eating, eating and chores. Right? You have breakfast. What are we going to eat? Lunch time's coming. We need to do something. It's dinner time. What are we eating? <laughs> And you're always thinking about your next meal. What happens if I take that away from you? I give you time off so you can focus on something more important. Okay? I was joking around with the group, but over the years, coming on a Yom Kippur, now this is a dry force for those who can. No water, no food. Sunset comes, you stop till the next day. Mm -hmm. Go through service. Now we normally get together to break fast, right? So we get together about three o'clock, go through the service, talk about Jonah, try and bring the heart in of why we're doing this, and then we break fast together because now we're in a good space with other. And the amount of schlepping you see when people pitch up at three o'clock, they've got headaches. Mm -hmm. They're tired. Mm. They're grumpy. Mm. The last thing you see in their eyes is joy. <sighs> and it was as if you, they're literally about four seconds away from collapsing. And all they can think of is what they don't have. Their focus shifts completely from me and God and what I did wrong to why don't I get coffee, why don't I get food, why are we doing this, this is silly. But to truly allow yourself the time when it's not consumed by breakfast, lunch and dinner, or coffee breaks, or a, or a tea here, and a biscuit here, and all this here, and now I have all that time to focus on God, it is like all of a sudden your day went from 24 hours to 36 hours because now you have all this spare time and you're not distracted from the things that you're supposed to be busy doing don't work why because I need you to focus on me don't cook why because I don't need I need you to be focused on me get together why because I need you to be focused on me God interrupts your life to have a moment with you The king invites you to his table. But before you feast, you must fast. Mm -hmm. He says he makes an offering made by fire. We're going to talk about that offering in a bit. He says no work, no distractions. Mm -hmm. This is a statute forever. Mm -hmm. Christianity will teach us that God came, Yeshua died, he fulfilled all of these offerings, and now I don't have to worry about them. If that were true, why does God say it is forever? It is something you need to do forever. It's not until Christ comes. 
This is something you need to continually do. Do I have to sacrifice to deal with my sin? No. But I do need to sit at his feet and deal with my sin. It is a Sabbath. Focus. Creator, okay? Now from there. I'm deciding which direction I want to take you. Take the straight one. <laughs> <laughs> Not the <that one. laughs> All right. Let me deal with the Rosh Hashanah. This is going to hit you at a different angle before we get to level 16. I was <laughs> Leviticus 16. I'm going to... Where are we going? Leviticus 25, yeah, yeah. verse 8 to 11. count the sabbatical year according to that portion? Okay. <laughs> what does it say there? It says from when? Does it say from Yom Kippur? Yom Kippur is the time you declare. The tenth day of the seventh month. Yeah. So what do we have? He says you have your annual cycle mm -hmm. from Passover Aviv to Aviv, right? Mm -hmm. But now he's saying from Yom Kippur to Yom Kippur, mm -hmm. you will count your Shemitah cycle, your sabbatical years, that will add up to your 50th year, which will be the year of Jubilee, which you are to announce at Yom Kippur. Mm -hmm. So which cycle is it? <laughs> I, I read this once and I was like, but I don't know where we are. <laughs> so where do you start counting? Oh, don't worry about when you start counting. Focus on the picture first. Okay. On the tenth day of the seventh month, mm -hmm. sabbatical year cycles are counted to get to a jubilee. Why does he announce it on Yom Kippur? Why? Oh. Would you start counting on the tenth day of the seventh month? Or would you start counting on the first day of the first month? First day of the first month. Oh no, the seventh day because 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 <laughs> if the first day starts on um, Sunday and then like you go on Monday. Your hamster's already gone off track. <laughs> How about it has something to do with harvest time? Well, harvest time is Aviv, Bali, yeah. Shavuot, wheat, Sukkot. For Everything else is done. Yom Kippur, so we're not there yet. in the middle. What do we do? We fast. Well, yeah, you have to support. Maybe because... No, we don't know. Quickly, because... We have afflicted ourselves. It's a new mm -hmm. beginning. We are... I don't know. Not going oh, okay. <laughs> You, you've got See, to go with Yom it. Kippur <laughs> is n about setting you free. Sabbatical years are to tell us to do what? Let the land rest. Yeah. 
Okay, so every seventh year, six years I work the land, the seventh year I let it rest. Whatever comes up naturally, I can eat. It's God's provision for me. But this is where we leave it. I'm trusting in the Creator that He can take care of me. If I can trust that I can work six days and rest on the seventh, my land will work six years and rest on the seventh. But His cycle for that goes from Yom Kippur to Yom Kippur. Mm -hmm. And then He goes, I want you to count seven sevens. Seven sevens. And then we get to 49. And He says, on the 50th year, it's a jubilee. In Hebrew, or your bell. What do we get with your bell? What jubilee? What what does jubilee do for me? It sets me free to do what? You don't have to pay back. You return no. to your family. You get your ground back. Okay, you get your inheritance back. So if I go through a difficult time, me and my children now have to go work for Willem. I leave my land, I hire it out to someone else, they can only hire it, the inheritance is not theirs, they can't buy it from me. According to Torah, this is what God gave my family. This is our inheritance. It cannot be exchanged for money. What you can do is rent the land from Jubilee to Jubilee, from Sabbath to Sabbath. Not Sabbath week, but sabbatical year. What happens if we don't want to work the land or we fall on such bad times that I need to go and work for Villa? Maybe for the next 20 years. Yeah. What happens to my farm? Now, farm. Well, I have a farm called somebody else's university. I'm 70 years old now. My kids have grown yeah. up on someone else's yeah. farm. The Jubilee gets sounded. All of us are now set free to go yeah. claim our inheritance again. They get to go home. They get to go and work the land. They get to go because that was never lost. So a sabbatical year from Yom Kippur and Jubilee is about receiving the fullness of my inheritance. I want you to put that into the picture of salvation. If the Jubilee is about inheritance and it goes from Yom Kippur to Yom Kippur, count seven sevens to get to that position. Every time there's a Jubilee, I'm set free. Are you following me? Have we seen this number of seven sevens and then on the 50th something before? Think of your feasts. Yeah. What is it? It's the Feast of Weeks. Right. Pentecost is what? Right. Why is it called Pentecost? Because in Greek Pentecost means 50. So it says, from first fruits, you are to count seven sevens. And then on the 50th day, you are to declare Shavuot or Pentecost. They received the Torah, Holy Spirit got poured out. So Pentecost, the Shavuot and the Jubilee have something in common. What is the bride, covering of the bride, the veil, the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Spirit, have to do with inheritance? She receives gifts, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And when you come to the groom, where will you live? What land will you have? Well, she's freed from her parents, because she now has the gift. So what do you get through your husband? So what happens if your husband just happens to be the king of the universe? You get the universe. Are we starting to see something? <laughs> okay. So Yom Kippur has something to do with setting up the Jubilee. This is where we get the confusion with Rosh Hashanah. The Jews will go, well if the sabbatical cycles run from Yom Kippur to Yom Kippur, we can't exactly announce a new year on the 10th day of the 7th month, so we'll do it on the 1st day of the 7th month. You with me? That's where the Jewish calendar comes And that's when they go, it's Rosh Hashanah. But biblically, that's not the case. 
they're not trying to define a new year. What God is trying to do is he's trying to link two ideas together and trying to show you something about what he wants to do. It's the same with taking the Passover lamb and he says, paint the blood on the doorpost. And he goes, your mind's going to be blown when you see Yeshua. It's the same as we take the binding of Isaac and we take this 30-year-old man who allows himself to be bound and lies on an altar and I'm about to stab him. Most people get horrified at that story. At what point don't you think that this wimpy has completely lost his marbles and now just wants to kill his son? You know how many unbelievers struggle with that? You believe in a God who wants to sac tell this guy to sacrifice mm -hmm. his child. What type of God do you serve? It's like, no, he was telling you something about what's going to happen. I don't even want to know what's going to happen. The same God that you refuse to believe sacrificed his son. They it's, can't get past that. They, they, can't, they can't accept that. They can't even get to the full shadows. Uh, Never mind anything else. It makes no sense. And he's saying, listen, this is going to blow your mind when you understand that Isaac is a picture of Christ. It's like, look past and look at what I'm trying to show you. When he brings in the 50th and the Jubilee into Yom Kippur, he's saying, listen, you're getting everything. One day, you're getting everything. But to do that, we've got to do some work. Are you guys okay? Am I losing you? Have I lost you? Many times, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yes. <laughs> I like <laughs> I know this is a lot of information. Yom Kippur is a complex thing. Okay, there's a lot of there's a lot of teaching that has to go into this. The main framework is going to be done here. Mm. Leviticus 16. <laughs> We have our anniversary. <laughs> yeah. Yom Kippur. On, on that day. We started September last year. Oh. What was the first of first feast you, you did with it? For the first one. It was Yom Kippur. Because I went with that Yom Kippur. No, no, no. No. Yeah. Yom Kippur. The first. A happy we time of doing. What are we doing? You're not eating for the next yeah. 25 hours. <laughs> what is it? You guys have to eat. Yeah, honey. You had to take outside. Oh, that, no, was, that, that was tabernacles. Piece, tabernacles. That was tabernacles. Tabernacles, yeah. <sighs> All right. Yeah. Go to Leviticus 16 for me. <laughs> You're not allowed to be confused. You're supposed to be enlightened. So, with Aaron coming in, being reminded of his responsibility, understanding that he has to reflect God, gives us the picture of how we're supposed to lead people into this restoration in a sense okay what else what other offering did you see for Aaron for a, a ram for what for the burnt. what does a burnt offering represent Worship. yeah but how right okay it's an ole offering right so I take this offering nothing of that gets split everything goes up to God mm -hmm. so if that's a symbol of my heart condition, it's saying I have to surrender everything. Okay? Then what happens? Aaron? Fancy bling, Aaron? Yeah, and I had to put some clothes on. Yeah. Yeah, so some plain, clean, white, linen, verse. So why the shift in clothing? Why can't you do it in this? Why can't you do that in this normal garb? No, no, God goes back to the, uh, he starts with the simplicity of things. Make it white, no dress up now, no title, no rank, no. This is first you and I. We're going to sort your stuff out and then we can represent. Okay, part of? The linen is pure. Exactly. That seems always much the most thing. It's a boiled and fresh. Mixed fabric. Mixed fabric. Okay, 
Yeah, what what generally when when you when you see colors, what fabric are they using to dye? Ah, <laughs> no. Mm. Huh? We're gonna get it. At the... <laughs> it's the snails that they use to dye, or a cuttlefish. Yeah. Cuttlefish also gives a blue dye, but we understand from the the dyeing factories that we found archaeologically to the times of Messiah was probably a murex snail. Um, eh? No, we are they gonna be staring at each other in the dark anyway? Okay, you can still see. Okay, so if we go from there, I'm in the dark. If we go from there, <laughs> I'll set you up on my head. <laughs> so when we take a look at this and we go, okay, well, what were they able to dye? Were they able to dye linen in the times of Moses? No. Actually, linen was, because it's a plant base, was very difficult to penetrate. <coughs> so they used wool. Right. So imagine if you're slaughtering a bull in a wool tunic. Are you going to be smelling like that? No, no, you're going to be colored like that. You walk around in the dog. It's going to draw in, number one. Number two, it's about, listen, you are going to take off this... Thing like on the end shed or Dada said that you're gonna deal with this um, removing of linen is a symbol of purity and this is the point of today. It's not about your office. It's about you coming in first, dealing with yourself, and then once you have dealt with yourself in your household, then you can represent. And then you can come in and talk talk about Israel. Okay, that intercession idea that's going on here. All right. What was the next thing you saw? <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. what, what did you guys notice? Let's talk about the blood for a second when you make suffering. Oh, thank you. The, win the window is open. Okay. Okay, so what do we see with the with with the blood? Where does it sprinkle it? How does it sprinkle it? On the east. Yeah, on the east. The ones on, one on the east has the seven in the front. Seven in the front with his finger. Okay, yeah. let's focus on the east first. Why do we have to deal with the east? She said it's the door. Yeah? <laughs> it's faces. You said it was the door. <laughs> the 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 okay, why would he come in from the east? Hmm? Why? Because the sun rises. Nothing to do with the sun. Ah, oh, the moon goes down. <laughs> Nothing to do with the moon. Tabernacle stores on the east. Right, why? Because they got any Eden's angels is on the east. Right. <laughs> so and then I have to deal with again, I'm going back to the Garden yeah. of Eden. Garden of Eden. Right, so what was the problem? The problem is we got kicked out of the garden because we were not supposed to eat of the tree of life in our fallen state. So he puts two angels, cherubim. Would it be interested to find out that on the front of the door of the tabernacle is a pattern of angels, of cherubim? So that when you're coming in, it's as if you're coming back into the Garden of Eden, to the very throne room of God where I sat and I ate with him. But now I'm not eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. I actually want to eat of the tree of life. So when you're coming through the east gate, it's as if the relationship is being restored. It's a creation problem. You with me? Okay. So and then he goes up, okay, and you sprinkle it seven times. Now here's an interesting thing from a Babylonian Talmud. Okay, you know what the Talmud is? It's okay if you say no. No. Huh? No, that's a talit. Okay, talit is a pressure. So what we have is, you have the Torah, right? First five books of the Bible according to the instruction. Then you have a collection of books called the Mishnah. Mishnah is a collection of all the oral traditions and commentary on the Torah. Then you have a collection of books that is the commentary on the Mishnah. Yes. Commentary on the commentary. Pretty much. Mm -hmm. So basically what happens is, 
if you want to be like a really serious rabbi one day, you have to study the Talmud and study the Mishnah and then and then maybe do some of the Bible. That's the problem is the rabbis will quote more the Talmud than the Mishnah than they will quote the actual text. Okay? That's just been my experience. They focus more on what their rabbis have said more than what God says. And again, it's a tradition problem that we have. Okay? So he goes in according to the Talmud. Now, the Talmud sometimes will give you something interesting. Listen to this. I'm reading from a section called Yoma 5 verse 3. You, with a seven, with a sprinkling of the blood, you do one upward and seven downward across the shoulders. Dan ke matzlif in Hebrew. Ke matzlif with a movement of a swinging whip. Mm -mm, that's yeah. Catholic. Swing, that's swing. As if I'm hitting, hitting with so a whip. Not the whip. You <laughs> I dip with the blood. As if I'm hitting something with a whip. Like what? So the blood that is present, the blood gets given through a whipping motion. Isn't that what happened? Yeah. yeah. Now remember the Talmud, this is Judaism. This is not, we do this because of what happened to Messiah. Mm -hmm. In their traditions, you see the crucifixion. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, they take him, they sprinkle it on the east, and they do it in a whipping action. And then what? And then what? And then the other goats. Okay, then, then we get some goats. Yeah, you sacrifice the kids. So we take goats and then what do we do? One gets slaughtered and the one gets the sin. Mm. Okay, what do we do with or the one? Not slaughtered, off it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so one, one, what, what happens to the one with sin? What do we do with him? Mm. Well, before we go, what what does Gur mean? Gur means he gets all our sins. Okay, so remember, with any sin offering, there has to be a transference action. Okay, if you come into the altar or you come into the tabernacle and you stand over there and you say, "Okay, look, I've messed up," what do I do? Speak to the priest. Do I walk to the priest and say, "Hello, you smash copy? Okay, love you, bye." Exactly. He doesn't know what offering you want to do. Is it a burnt offering? Is it a peace offering? Yeah. What is it? I mean, some of these animals are used in different different ways. So how do I know what I'm supposed to do? Oh, this is because I was looking at that other person and I thought they were pretty. <laughs> I didn't think nice thoughts. You have a public confession. Yeah. Why is that important? Exactly. If I don't tell you what my sin is, and then I don't want to acknowledge it of sin, mm -hmm. it's not that that guy is going to be able to like, as in maybe Catholicism. And you were not looking at the pretty woman. That was lust. <laughs> <laughs> That's not owning it. <laughs> exactly. This is, isn't Catholicism where I have to go to someone to intercede on my behalf. Yeah. This is me owning it for myself. I am here because I messed up. I stole from somebody. I have to take that sin and I have to press it on the head of the animal I've come to. Not tap. Lean in and press. And then what? He gets taken out, the man gets chosen. No, no, no. What happens with the sin? What happens in the next piece of the sin offering? Where's the blood? Yeah. Well, the Levite will then go, okay, and he will take the my animal and walk in, and then he will slice and dice and blood pour and do whatever he needs to. Mm -hmm. Is that a faith-based thing or a works-based thing? Works. Is it's it? Faith. Faith. Yeah. Done by something. I want you to think about it. Nothing Is it the action of the slaughtering of the yeah. animal that deals with my no. sin? Or is it the faith that I believe my sin has been transferred to the head of that animal? And yes. the faith, yes. remember, I'm at the door. 
I have to believe that God has accepted that offering. I have to believe that that has gone up in substitution. And this is how we set up against the the crucifixion. I go through the process. Same way here. I transfer onto the head. Mm -hmm. That animal does what? What does it get to do? It goes to the wilderness to a place called? Azazel. 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 And what, what is Azazel? Did you guys find anything? Did you just go, well, that's a weird place, move on? We didn't read anything about it in my Bible. Yeah, we called it the wilderness. Yeah, we didn't go Okay. As. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 16. Yeah, 16. Verse 26. Yeah, 26 mentions Azazel. 26. Yeah. I've got the Azazel. Mm. Have you? 20, 26. How you've got that Hebrew Bible? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, no. So what? What uh, is it? The man who leaves, who leaves the goat as a scapegoat mm-hmm. is to wash his clothes and bathe his body in water. Afterwards, he may come into the yeah, camp. Yeah, he scapegoat is as a zel. Scapegoat is as a zel. Yeah, yeah, but that's not exactly the not, scapegoat. Yeah. Uh, I knew I was a zel when I was in standard eight, but... It was Lizelle. Oh, really? Yeah. 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 Azazel, Azazel, according to Jewish tradition, has two different thoughts. One is it's a place in the wilderness. Some believe that it was sort of like a cliff area. So I would take with the sin and I would go... And then he would fall off, he would be dead that way. The sin would never ever return into the camp. I will remove your sin as far as the east is from the west. You see that east thing coming in again? Mm-hmm. And then you, other people believe that Azazel was a wilderness demon. Oh, no. I don't prescribe to this. I think it sounds too much like I'm going to feed this goat to this demon. Mm-hmm. And then it, to me that sounds very much too, too much to um, witchcraft yeah. worship yeah. that thing. Yeah, I'll that's weird. <laughs> Either way, whether it was a cliff or whether it was a place in the wilderness where this was going to be lent out to die, the picture is your sin is leaving never to return. Okay? It's dealt with. Now, what does that mean for you? Your sin has been dealt with. You start over. Okay. How many of you practice that? Can you remember a big sin that you did two years ago? Three years ago? Can you remember a sin that you're kind of embarrassed about? Yeah. Does God? No. Then why do we? What's the principle? So what is the big thing that we go I'm asking it's that silly question. I know it's to forgive, over. forgive yourself. Mine, not mine. Why do you remember it? Why do you remember it? No, no, focus, focus. Why do you remember it? Because I haven't yeah. asked for forgiveness from the people who have wronged me. Okay, well, if that's the case, then maybe God is because telling you to fix other up. Other people remind you of it. <laughs> other people remind that Satan's that Satan's trap. But the simple reality about it is, a lot of the times is that you you might accept the forgiveness of God, but you don't forgive yourself. Yeah. So He says, "Look, I've forgotten about it. Let's move on." And you're going, "Yeah, but I'm just that person who did mm. that thing." Mm. What does that do for your mindset when you deal with God? Mm-hmm. You always remember that time you denied Christ. Yeah. You always remember that time when you betrayed him. You always remember that time and that kind of set you up as, I'm no good, I'm not accepted, I'm nothing but a sinner. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're a sinner, but you're forgiven. Mm -hmm. 
yes, you have salvation. You have to kind of move forward to the fact of saying, listen, if God has forgiven me and he's forgotten about it, I can too. Satan will remind you of your sin continually. Why? Because he's the great accuser, number one. Number two, if you're nothing but a useless sinner, then that's all you're going to act like. You're going to be running around full of guilt, full of brokenness, full of emptiness. You're going to run. Mm. 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 Mm